So shall, shall I ask uh, Mike to introduce the speaker? Welcome sure. to the second, uh, second okay. talk of uh, scheduling seminar series. Mike, go okay. ahead, please. Okay. Okay, this will be a, a two-minute introduction, but it could have been 20 minutes, but uh, you probably prefer to listen to Moore rather than to me. Moore has gotten her PhD at Berkeley, was at MIT for a couple of years, and now is, uh, is a big shot at Carnegie Mellon. And in stochastic scheduling, she is one of the, the, one of the really important people. All of you, of course, in performance analysis in computer systems and cloud computing, she is really the one who uh, spearheading all that research. Um, all of you, of course, have read her book, at least the stochastic people. And if you are deterministic and don't know too much about this area, I can tell you this area is fascinating. Okay, more you can start. Wow, thank you for that introduction. So thank you, um, Mike, Stenek, and Hua Hua for inviting me. I'm very honored to be here. So my name is Moore Harkel Balter. I'm in the computer science department at Carnegie Mellon University. And as a computer scientist, um, I work in, oh, uh, well, the computer is not moving yet. <coughs> Give me a second. Here we go. Okay, it's starting, just a little lag. So as a computer scientist, I work in a whole bunch of areas related to computer systems, multi-core architectures, operating systems, energy management, databases. And what I found is that scheduling is at the heart of all of these. Scheduling really is the key to improving computer system performance. And so we're gonna be talking about scheduling and scheduling comes in two different flavors. So the flavor that you heard Jan Carl um, and David talked to you about last time is the worst case flavor. So in this worst case flavor, you assume that there's this very bad adversary and the adversary is coming to get you. And the adversary is choosing the job sizes to send to the scheduling policy. And the adversary is also choosing the arrival times and choosing them in a way that's really bad <laughs> to try to mess up the scheduling algorithm. By contrast, I'm gonna be talking about stochastic scheduling. So in stochastic scheduling, the job sizes are drawn from some distribution and the arrival times are also drawn from some distribution. Now, if you're someone who works in stochastic scheduling like I do, it's very important that when you say things are drawn from a distribution, that you pick distributions that are realistic or that you talk about general distributions that where something can apply for any distribution. So I will be cognizant of that. Um, and of course, there are models that mix the two, but we're going to be talking about the stochastic model. So for those of you not familiar with the stochastic community, there are a whole bunch of us in the stochastic community. This is just a few pictures. Um, Rhonda Ryder is um, on the committee for the scheduling seminar. And here is Anu Boxma. I consider him to be the modern day father of queuing. So there are a lot of great people in the stochastic scheduling community but I'm going to assume that people don't know about stochastic scheduling and I'm gonna start with the basics. So we have a queue and a server and jobs are arriving over time. So this is a job, a big job. And when it arrives, it's at the server and it gets worked on. And so you can see over here, this orange part is the service that's been done on the job. And then now another job arrives and maybe the job at the server gets worked on a little more and another job arrives and so on. And we get more work done. So this stuff in orange is what I call the age. That's the attained service. I wanna be very, very clear. Age is not how long you've been in the system. Age is how much work has been done on the job. The only job that's getting work done on it is the job that's at the server. So it's how much, how much service the job has already received. And this green part that's left over here is the remaining size of a job. It's what's left. Okay, and the whole thing all together is the size. Now at any moment in time, there could be a scheduling policy that changes who's being worked on. So the scheduling policy might switch the jobs and whatever age was accumulated here, whatever work was accumulated here that had been done stays. And now this other job starts getting worked on. Okay, so at all times, the job at the server is being worked on. And we're gonna be interested in the response time. So I'm gonna use T for response time. You can think of this as flow time. It's the time from when a job arrives 
all the way until it's done. Okay, however long it takes with however many switches. So in the stochastic scheduling community, we use a term called MG1. And the M here stands for Markovian, which means that the arrival process is a Poisson process. And you can think of this as at every moment in time, there are lambda jobs coming in per second. Okay, there's some steady rate of jobs coming in per second, lambda jobs per second coming in. Now, the sizes of the jobs is what G is about. So G says that the job size distribution is general. So I can have any kind of general job size distribution. And I'm going to use the random variable X here to be talking about when I talk about the job size distribution. So X is going to be the job size. And you can see the job sizes are drawn from this distribution. There are many different sizes, small and big. And for each job, it's in some state at the moment. It's had some amount of work done on it. That's its age. And it has some remaining service. That's what's left. Okay. The one last thing that I want to say, the last piece of notation, is this notion of load, which is the fraction of time that the server is busy. So we call that row. And that's the arrival rate. So suppose there's three jobs coming in per second. And suppose on average, they take a quarter of a second, then we say that the server is busy three quarters of the time. So the load is three quarters. And it's very important that this load be less than one, otherwise the queue is going to explode. Okay, so th this is it for notation for what you need to know about stochastic scheduling. Arrival rate lambda, response time t, okay, and the jobs are x, x is the job size. And with that in hand, I'm ready to ask my first question. And I know that you're muted. So when you answer it, um, you can answer it in the chat and I will look. Okay. So here is a um, queue and you see the jobs of different sizes. And I'm going to start with a nice easy question, which is what scheduling policy is going to minimize the mean response time, E of T. So this is the time from when you arrive until you leave. And I want to minimize the average over all jobs. And I would like somebody to, to chat me the answer so we can move on. I am waiting impatiently. Okay, SRPT. So SRPT is the correct answer. Um, and um, thank you, Horace, for, for posting this to everybody. Thank you very much. So SRPT stands for shortest remaining processing time. And it basically says at every moment in time, work on the job that has the least green area left, okay? And this is basically what we do when we sit at our desks and we're always trying to work on the job that we can finish as quickly as possible. And if something comes in and it's even smaller, we work on that job, okay? The first analysis in an MG1 of the SRPT algorithm, shortest remaining processing time, was done by Schraga in 1966 that I know of. Okay, so one might ask, how much does it really matter? So we know SRPT is optimal, but does, you know, does it really make a difference? So the answer lies in looking at the variability and the job size distribution. So this is the squared coefficient of variation, and it's basically the variance of the job size divided by the mean job size squared. So it's a normalized variance. And when the C squared is one, we consider that to be reasonably low squared coefficient of variation. So you see there's reasonably low variability in the job sizes. And the effect of that is that if you look at the mean response time as a function of load under first come first serve and SRPT, two scheduling policies, they're reasonably close, okay? Because SRPT working on the short jobs is not helping you that much. By contrast over here, we see the squared coefficient of variation could be 100. And now there's a lot of variability in the job sizes. And so now there's a huge difference between SRPT and first come first serve. And this makes perfect sense because SRPT is allowing the short jobs to get ahead of the long jobs. And first come first serve is blocking the short jobs behind the long jobs. Okay, so FIFO scheduling or first come first serve scheduling is not a good idea when you have high variability. But you might wanna ask yourself, what kind of variability do we really have in practice? 
So let's take a quick look at job size variability. So back when I was a PhD student a long, long time ago in 1996, I was busy measuring the job sizes for Unix jobs. And in measuring the job size for Unix jobs, you know, I came up with some distribution of the job sizes and it fit uh, what's called a bounded Pareto, okay, with some alpha parameter of one. But what was interesting about this distribution was how high the variability was. The squared coefficient of variation was 50, which was considered very high at the time. Okay, very high variability. Furthermore, the top 1% of jobs, if you look at the biggest 1%, they occupied 50% of the load. So you have just this little 1% of jobs, but they're so big that they make up 50% of the total load. And so the upshot of this whole thing was that I realized scheduling really matters. You really have to worry about protecting short jobs from long jobs. So, okay, that was a long time ago, back in 1996. Let's move on to today. So fortunately, I do a lot of work with Google and I had a chance just this last year to measure job sizes again. And the job sizes in Google were very interesting. You know, I made a plot and all this kind of stuff. And I found that they too had a bounded Pareto kind of distribution with a different alpha parameter, a lower alpha parameter. Now, would anybody like to guess how variable these jobs were? How high was the squared coefficient of variation for the Google jobs? Would anybody like to guess? 500, that is a good guess. Would anybody like to guess anything else? Thank you, Maria. Anyone else? Anybody wanna go higher or lower than Maria? 100, okay. Well, that was the wrong direction. Okay, <laughs> maybe we wanna go up. So the true answer is 23,000, okay? This is the variability we're dealing with now. And if you're stunned, I was stunned too. I just kept checking and checking and checking the data, okay? 23,000 is a squared coefficient of variation. The top 1% of jobs comprise 99% of the load on the system, okay? And the upshot of all of this is scheduling really matters. So if you're a scheduling person, you should be very happy because you're doing the stuff we really need to all be doing. Okay, the bad news is so few scheduling policies are actually analyzable. If you open up the book by Kleinbrock, which I consider to be the, um, the book on scheduling, you know, that I first learned from, um, and you look at the MG1Q, you'll see some formulas. They're nice formulas. These are formulas for first come first serve, mean response time, for SRPTs, mean response time. And you'll see some similar formulas for a few other scheduling policies. But really it's just a handful of scheduling policies. And when you look at it, there's so many scheduling policies we don't know how to analyze, if only we could analyze them. So that leads me to the outline of this talk. Um, this talk is really about some research that we've done in the past three years. Um, so it's very recent, unlike the last talk, um, and I will try to make it as clear as possible. So I'm going to start with an MG1 that you've already seen. And what's going to happen in this first part of the talk is we're going to talk about all the scheduling policies for the MG1. And when you look at the scheduling policies that were analyzable, that were tractable before 2018, as I said, it's reasonably small as the set of scheduling policies. But what we're gonna do in this talk is extend that set to a much bigger class called the SOAP class. And these are gonna be scheduling policies that we can analyze today. And I'm gonna show you how to do that, okay? And then after that, I'm gonna move into the MGK. This is just like an MG1, but it has K servers that are drawing from the queue. And unfortunately in the MGK scheduling in multi-server systems is really wide open. So um, even when you just have first come first serve, <laughs> you know, not that much is known in terms of closed form formulas for exact formulas for an MGK. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna come up with the first bounds um, on scheduling policies in the MGK and the first of these optimality results in here. Okay, so there are a bunch of papers that are relevant to this talk. 
And many of you won't recognize the conferences, but the conferences are known in the stochastic community, Sigmetrics and Performance Conferences. So these are the big names for the stochastic community. And really all the work I'm talking about is being done by two people. Um, and they may look very young. This is Ziv Scully and Isaac Grossoff, and they are young, they're just PhD students, but they're graduating very soon. So if you're looking to hire, these are your candidates. Okay, They've, they're the ones who've basically contributed all the work here. Okay, so let's get to the heart of it. So we want to talk about scheduling policies and I'm gonna introduce this class called the SOAP class. SOAP stands for scheduling ordered by age-based priority. So your priority, okay, your rank or priority is a function of your age. SOAP policies are defined to be all policies that can be expressed via a rank function. A rank function is a priority function. Where the rank, the priority, is a function of age, and the rank can also be a, a function of the job size or class, okay? The idea is you always serve the job of lowest rank. Lowest rank is the one that gets priority. And if two jobs have the same rank, you do first come first serve tie breaking. So I'm now gonna go through a whole bunch of examples because I know this isn't clear. So let's start with some classic SOAP policies that you all already know. So let's start with something like SRPT, shortest remaining processing time. So the rank of the job is the remaining processing time, what's left on the job, what's left to do. And here we have the age, which is how much we've already done. That's the attained service. So if you have a job that comes in and has size five, it starts out with a rank of five because that's its remaining time, remaining processing time. And then its rank drops down to zero as it ages because its remaining time, which is its rank, is dropping, okay, as it ages. So if I have two jobs here and one has age, say one, and one has age like four, the job on the right of age four is the one that has higher priority because it has a lower rank. It has lower remaining time. Lower is better for the rank, okay? All right, so now there might be also a job of size three that comes in and it has a rank function. So the rank is allowed to depend on the age and the job size or class, okay? So different jobs can have different ranks, okay? Different rank functions depending on their size or class. And you might have say two jobs over here and one is a job of size five, but it has, it has very low rank because it has very little left. And another is a job of initial size three, but it has more left to go. So its rank is higher. And the job that gets priority is this job on the right over here that has less left to go. So even though its original size was higher, its rank is lower, okay? So that's good. It's good to have low rank. We want low rank. So that's SRPT. Let's look at another policy we can express with a rank function. So say you look at priority, okay? So imagine you have two classes where class one always has priority over class two. So you wanna say all the jobs in class one have priority over class two. So the way you're gonna do it is you're gonna make class one have a rank over here and then class two is gonna have a worse rank. So every job from class one is gonna have lower rank than, the, than a job from class two. Within a class, within class one, we're gonna use our first come first serve tie breaking to say the jobs get done in first come first serve order, okay? So very simple rule for how you set up these rank functions. Okay, let's try another one, first come first serve. First come first serve, all the jobs have the same rank, your age doesn't matter. Okay, let's try another policy. Here's another classic policy, it's called least attained service. In least attained service, you wanna give priority to the job that has attained the least service so far, that has received the least service so far. So if that has the lowest age, you wanna give that job priority. So that rank function looks like this because you're giving priority to the job with a lower age, okay? So hopefully at this point, you understand something about rank functions, okay? So when we look at the policies with the known analysis pre-2018, these are nice examples like SRPT, first come, first serve, LAS, things like that, okay? 
but I said that I'm going to extend this class. So you might be wondering what else is in SOAP. So these other policies are already in SOAP. What else is in SOAP? Okay. So when you look at the policies that we have talked, have been talking about and that we know well, these policies all have monotonic rank functions. What that means is the rank function either goes straight up or it goes straight down or it goes straight across, but it doesn't go up and down. Okay. They're monotonic rank functions. The new stuff that SOAP has is policies with non-monotonic rank functions. So these are the rank or priority of a job can go up and down. And you might say to yourself, who cares? Why do we care about a non-monotonic rank function? Where does this come up? Okay, why is this important? So the answer is that these non-monotonic rank functions come up when you in situations where you don't know the size of a job, but you still need to schedule, you still want to do shortest remaining processing time, but you don't know the size of a job. So let's take a look at what that looks like. So it's going to be another nice question. How do we schedule when we don't know the size of a job? So here's a queue, and we wish we could see which jobs were small, but they all, they all look the same to us. We have no idea which are small. We can only see the age or service that they've received so far, maybe, okay? And we do know the job size distribution. So we know exactly what the job size distribution is. We just don't know what the sizes of the jobs are. And we would like to work on the one with the shortest remaining processing time. Is there any way that we can approximate working on shortest remaining processing time by somehow making use of the fact that we know the job size distribution? Like we've been watching the jobs over time. So we've collected information about the, the basic distribution of jobs, okay? Because we've been watching them complete over time. But these jobs, we don't know. We don't know how to schedule them. So is there anything that we might be able to do to handle? this? Is there anything that sounds like SRPT? Instead of shortest remaining processing time, can we do something else since we don't know the remaining processing time? Anybody? I'm waiting in my chat. Again, very impatiently. Expected SRPT. Lovely. Thank you. Thank you, Nicholas. Okay. So I call this shortest expected remaining processing time. Okay, so SERPT stands for shortest expected remaining processing time. And this sounds very similar to SRPT. So let's take a look at what this looks like. So if you look at shortest expected remaining processing time, let's, let's do an example, okay? Here's a job size distribution. And we'll say that the jobs are of size either one or six or 14, each with probably a third. It's a very simple job size distribution. And I'm going to try to create again, a rank function is a function of age, where now my rank is my expected remaining size at age A. So when I start out at age zero, my expected remaining size is the average of one and six and 14, and that is seven, okay? So my expected remaining size is seven, and it goes down as I age. Now, my job might complete now, okay, because it might only be of size one, so it might complete. But if it doesn't complete, and I now want to compute the expected remaining size once one unit is done, the remaining size might be five, okay, because one has already been done, or it might be 13. And the average of those two numbers is nine. So my expected remaining size jumped all the way up, okay? And now my expected remaining size goes down until six and the job might complete, okay? So my expected remaining size now is four. But if the job doesn't complete, then the remaining size on it, once it's achieved age six, is just the remaining here, which is eight. So it has a sure thing of eight remaining and then the remaining size goes down. So when you look at this rank function, Okay, you can see that it goes up and down. And this is showing you the function, the actual function here is the expected value of X minus A given X is bigger than A, A being the age. So this is expected remaining size. 
And the idea is you're always going to run the job with the lowest rank. This is what SOAP does. You always run the job. And this is clearly a SOAP policy. It's a SOAP policy because I expressed SERPT in terms of rank function. And what was interesting here is that the rank was non-monotonic. Okay, so this is one example of a non-monotonic. So you might ask yourself, well, is this the best you can do when you have unknown job sizes? So um, should you do, should you be doing shortest expected remaining processing time? Is this really the right policy to do? So let's consider what SERPT says. So suppose you have a job here of age 11 and you have a different job here of age four. SERPT would say this job on the right has shorter expected remaining time than this job on the left, okay? So we should work on the job on the right. That seems okay, okay? Seems reasonable. But suppose the job on the left is almost of size six, okay? It's, well, almost of age six, rather. I don't know what its size is, okay? But it's almost of age six. It's just delta away from being of age six. Now, the job on the left has a higher rank, which is worse than the job on the right. The job on the right looks better. It has lower rank, okay? The job on the left looks worse. It has higher rank. But I'm telling you that it's only just delta away from being age six, a little bit away from being, from being age six. Maybe you should just run it for that delta amount of time and maybe it'll just finish and maybe you'll get another job out of your system, okay? The answer is if Delta gets small enough, you should just do that. You should take a chance and see if you can finish off a job, okay? Because you're only gonna expend Delta amount of work. So rather than working on this job, you should work on this job. And that idea is not mine, that's the Gittins idea, okay? And you can read the Gittins' book from 2011, okay? And the idea in the Gittins policy is you can see that these jobs just before age one and age six, they suddenly have rank zero, okay? The best rank. Because if they get really close to that, you should work on them. And the exact formula is here. And the main thing is it takes this delta into account, which is the probability of finishing in the next little delta, okay? You're looking at the probability of finishing in the next little delta. And that's very important in Gittins. But from our perspective, Gittins is important because it's actually the best policy. It is the optimal policy in an MG1 setting for, for minimizing mean response time when you don't know the job sizes or you have only partial knowledge, okay? So it's a great policy. Okay, Gittins is another example of a policy whose rank is non-monotonic. So going back to our page over here, when we look at all scheduling policies and we look at the ones known before 2018 and we look at the ones that are now tractable, we're going to add SCRPT and Gittins to this list. And the first analysis of these policies in the MG1 appeared in the SOAP paper, which is one of the papers I mentioned in the beginning, okay? So, those are two very nice policies that we can say, now we can analyze them, but there are so many more policies. So I'm going to give you another example. So one of the things that comes up in computer science is we have these very nice scheduling policies, but we're limited in how many preemptions we can do. We can only do the preemption at certain points where the state has been saved, and, and those are called checkpoint states. So imagine, for instance, you have some scheduling policy and it has a rank function, you know, so maybe maybe at first the rank is low and then it goes up and then it goes down, whatever, some any rank function you want. But the point is you're only allowed to preempt jobs at these certain green checkpoints, okay, because that's the place where state is saved at these ages. So the question is, how do you adapt to the rank function to indicate this, that you can only, you can only preempt at these checkpoints? And the answer is you give very low rank, even negative rank outside of these checkpoints, okay? At, only at the checkpoints are you allowed to preempt and go back to the regular rank. In between, you have very, very low rank. And this is yet another example of the rank being non-monotonic, 
And this is very important in computer science because we have a lot of these policies where we can only preempt at certain times. Okay, so the rank is non-monotonic. Um, I'm gonna talk about one more example, okay? This one is interesting. Um, it's, it's actually interesting to me personally because my son um, had done some work at Amazon and on Amazon when they're, when they're running things and actually you know, managing, you know, serving people, um, they have humans who are on the floor who are like getting packages for you, but they're also robots, okay? Who are in there with the humans. And so here's an example where humans have priority, humans have top priority, because of course we should give humans priority and robots have second priority, but humans are kind of finicky people. So, you know, humans do not like to be preempted, okay? They really don't. And they have completely unknown size. You never know how long they're gonna take, okay? They can take forever. And they also like to be served first come first serve because if it's not first come first serve, they immediately complain that it's unfair. Okay, so robots, on the other hand, they don't have any of these problems. Robots, you can preempt them as much as you want. You know the size because you program the job that they're running. Okay, and you might as well do SRPT because we just said it was optimal. Okay, so you now have two classes of jobs and they have very different scheduling policies. Okay, which is something that people hadn't thought about before, but I really wished, you know, was a solved problem. Furthermore, you can add all sorts of complexities here. Like you can add a twist saying, if the remaining size of the robot is not too high, okay, so maybe the robot has just a little bit left to do, then maybe you should give the robot priority over any human that hasn't started yet, okay? So complexities like this, you can add all these twists. And it turns out that you can actually write rank functions that encompass all of this stuff, you need a two-dimensional rank function. But aside from that, it's a rank function and therefore it's in SOAP. So to summarize, we talked about policies that we could analyze before 2018. And these are policies with monotonic rank functions. We then talked about the SOAP class and we talked about policies that have non-monotonic rank functions, multi-dimensional rank functions, anything you can write as a rank function, okay? You can make it as complicated as you want. And we talked about SCRPT, Gittins, limited checkpoints, any policy with limited checkpoints, mixed priorities, um, and we could go on for other scheduling policies. The bottom line is given any rank function, we can give you with the SOAP analysis, um, we can give you a closed form response time for the mean and the transform. So, okay, so you give me the rank function and we'll give you the closed form response time, the mean and the transform, so includes all moments. All right, that finishes off SOAP and I'm concluding this section. We talked about all these scheduling policies, the known ones and the SOAP ones, and I'm checking this off. So I'm now moving to part two of my talk. So in part two, I'll be talking about an MGK system. This is a multi-server system with K servers. And um, sadly, as I said, scheduling in multi-server systems is really wide open. Even if you just say you wanna have first come first serve scheduling here, we have a hard time with analyzing K server systems. I mean, there've been many papers written on first come first serve, but once you start putting a complicated scheduling policy in there, really nothing is known for how to handle it. So I'm gonna talk about the first bounds and optimality. And I'm gonna start with the easier case of assuming known job sizes. So I'm gonna start by assuming we know exactly the job sizes. So here we have our K server system. This is the MGK. And remember the M stands for some kind of Poisson arrival process. So at all times, there's a steady rate of Lambda jobs per second. And the G says that the job size distribution can be any distribution. So I'm gonna have my usual totally arbitrary job size distribution, any general job size distribution. And the K stands for the fact that there are K servers. And we're gonna assume a job size is known when it arrives. So um, we're gonna use the same picture. This is the job size. This is the age, which is the work done on the job. And this is its remaining size. 
and we'll assume at any moment in time there are jobs of different in different states in here. Like this job has not received any work yet done on it. And some of the jobs are like almost done. They have a high age and very little left to go, okay? And our goal is going to be to minimize again, the response time, which is the time from when a job arrives until it leaves. So again, we're gonna ask this question, how should we schedule to minimize the mean response time? And the job sizes are entirely known to you. So you know who's small and who's big, you know exactly what they have left, you know what their remaining time is, you know everything you need to know, how should you schedule? So by schedule, I mean like, which jobs do you put in the servers and which jobs do you let sit out here? Like how do you decide which jobs to be running in your case servers at all times? So I would like to ask the audience again, um, for which jobs I should be running. Anyone? Would anybody like to tell me which jobs I should be running? You've already heard the answer. You've heard the words. Anybody would like to say anything about which jobs will minimize mean response time? Okay, so I think I think the, the worst case community, the deterministic people might be like a, a little bit scared here to answer because maybe they know that the things aren't so good anymore. But let me just go ahead and, and say the obvious kind of answer. And the obvious kind of answer is, well, you know, now we have case servers. Before we had one server and we said we should do SRPT, maybe we should still do SRPT. Maybe we should do shortest remaining processing time, but basically we should run the K jobs that have the shortest remaining time on them. Maybe that's the right thing to do, okay? It sounds good. So what has happened is that the worst case community, who's very intelligent here, has already dismissed this policy. So why? Okay, well, it turns out that SRPTK, which means run the K jobs with the shortest remaining processing time, is far from optimal in the worst case. So there is a beautiful result by Leonardi and Ross from 1997, and then some follow-up papers in 2007, that you can look at. And it basically says the competitive ratio of a policy like SRPT is high, okay? In fact, it's log of the min of two terms, you see these terms here, and one of the terms has N in it, which is the number of arrivals. So this is very, very high, okay? And the other term is the ratio between the maximum job size and the minimum job size. And I just told you these job size distributions are very, very, very variable, okay? So there can be a high ratio. And so this is also pretty disappointing. And when you, when you look at it, you might wonder what's so wrong with SRPTK? Like, why is it bad, okay? And the reason really has to do with poor bin packing when the adversary is in charge. Like the adversary can send you two little jobs to SRPT and SRPTK is gonna say, oh, I'm gonna run those two little jobs and put the big job back here, okay? But really, then once the two little jobs are finished, the, the big job is still gonna have stuff going on and there'll be a server that's idle, okay? And you can end up with all sorts of bad bin packing situations where really you would have liked to have taken the big job and put it here and the two little jobs will run one after another, okay? And get better bin packing. And that's the heart of what goes wrong here. Now, the even worse news is that no other policy does better, okay? So every policy has at least this competitive ratio. And so the problem appears closed. Like, what can you do? You know, I mean, it's just, just a bad competitive ratio. So what can you do? So the thing is, Maybe it's not so bad though, when an adversary isn't specifically trying to trick you with a worst case arrival sequence. So what we ask is maybe SRPTK is not bad when you're looking at an MGK setting. So maybe when you have a setting with Poisson arrivals and the job sizes are coming from some general job size distribution, any job size distribution, but it's a general job size distribution. Maybe when you have that, you should do SRPTK, okay? Um, unfortunately, the state of the art for MGK scheduling, as I said, is mostly non-existent. So we're going to have to invent a way to try to figure out what to do here. 
And um, that's what I'm gonna talk about on my next slide. So I'm gonna talk about a new approach for thinking about scheduling in the MGK. And the idea is really simple, okay? So here's an MGK system um, doing SRPTK. We don't know how to analyze it, but we do know how to analyze SRPT1. We do know how to analyze a single server system because we learned about that back in like the 1960s, okay? So, so we have a K server system, one server system. Maybe we can relate the two of them together. So maybe we can look at the K server system as having servers of speed one over K. So they're all of speed one over K and relate that to a single server of speed one. So I'm not really saying I'm, we can handle any general MGK. I'm just for the purpose of this proof, I'm going to assume that the speeds here are, these are, there are more servers, but they're slower. Okay, so that I can comparably compare it to a single server. And the load here, remember, is the fraction of time that the server is busy. And load here means the same thing, but it's the average fraction of servers that are busy, okay? And so the idea is we're going to try to relate this system to this system, okay? So when you think about optimal scheduling in a K server system, the response to them by definition is worse than optimal scheduling in a single server system because the single server system is like all powerful, okay? It can always get work done. And the K server system, you know, sometimes only has one job and it's running at a slow speed, okay? So, so this is a, a clear relationship. Furthermore, we know that the optimal scheduling for a single server system is SRPT1, okay? Because we already talked about that. And what we're gonna now do is look at SRPTK which is at least as high as whatever the optimal is for a K server system. So here's the idea. If we can show that SRPTK, this mean response time under SRPTK is related to the mean response time under SRPT1, if we can show that they're close together, then we've sandwiched opt inside. And that already tells us that SRPTK is optimal. Okay, if we can show that this is close to this. So we're gonna show two results. We're gonna show the first bound on SRPTK, and it turns out it looks like this. And you'll see that the mean response time for SRPTK is in fact related to the mean response time for the SRPT1 system, plus some other stuff, okay? We'll also show an optimality result, which says, if you are in high load as rho goes to one, if the system is busy, okay? And you look at the SRPTK system, which is busy working, and you look at the SRPT1 system, which is busy working, as the load gets higher, they basically become the same. And so this ratio goes to one, okay? And that says that this becomes this, so SRPTK is optimal, which we kind of believe anyway, okay? It's just those bad adversaries, okay? So I'm only going to discuss the key idea in the proof. The one key idea, okay? There's a lot of other ideas, but this is the key idea. The key idea is to be looking at SRPTK and SRPT1 with respect to only a job of size X, this yellow job, and look at, so I'm gonna pick an arbitrary size X and look at the relevant work relative to size X, relevant to this job of size X. So I'm gonna look at the, the relevant work here, okay, what this job of size X sees ahead of it, and what the job of size X sees ahead of it over here. And the claim is that the relevant work relative to this job of size X is similar in SRPT1 and in SRPTK. That's the idea. I wanna show that they're similar. And so I'm gonna define this thing called Delta, which is the difference in the relevant work that you see in the two systems. And I wanna show that Delta is small, okay? So when you think about it, the SRPTK system is at a disadvantage, obviously, compared to the SRPT1 system. But we can divide time into intervals. There are times when there are very few jobs in the system. And when there are very few jobs in the SRPTK system, okay, then the SRPTK system is at more of a disadvantage because it's only maybe busy with two of its servers or something. And so it's losing a lot of capacity, okay? But when there are many jobs in the two systems, then the systems are basically working at the same rate, okay? Everything is good. 
okay? And the SRPTK system can catch up. So specifically, if we're in a few jobs regime where there are fewer than K relevant jobs in the SRPTK system, what we can say is because there are fewer than K jobs, the difference, the, the amount behind that SRPT can, can be is only KX. So this delta has to be something less than KX because there just aren't that many jobs. And during the other intervals, you do catch up and SRPTK catches up to SRPT1. And this is great because it means that the difference in relevant work is bounded by KX. This is the key idea is to bound the difference in relevant work that, that you see. Because in SRPT, all you see is work that's relevant to you, the jobs that have less remaining time than you. Once we have this bound, we can quickly translate it into a bound on mean response. Maybe not so quickly, but I'm skipping a lot of steps and we can get a bound on mean response time. And this is the first bound that I talked about where I said SRPTK is related to SRPT1. Now, this term over here that you see, this term that I've circled, it would be very interesting to get a handle on what that is. Fortunately, there's some very brilliant people, Lynn, Weirman, and Spot, who analyzed SRPT1 back in 2011 and found, and using their work, we can show that this term is really like little o of the mean response time under SRPT1 as, as load goes to one. So in the limit as load goes to one, there's like, this is like a little o term. And what that tells us is that the mean response time under SRPTK under high load, under high rho, rho goes to one, is like SRPT1 plus a little o term and that's what leads us to get this optimality result, okay? So that's how we put it all together. So hopefully that made some sense, okay? I'm now gonna show you just some pretty pictures. Here's say a uniform distribution K servers. Here's a ratio between SRPTK and SRPT1 as a function of load. This is the actual result. This is simulation, okay? And you can see that when load is light, the SRPTK system is 10 times worse than the SRPT1 system because we have 10 servers. But when load is heavy, that's when SRPTK starts to look good. What we have is a bound for all loads. This is our bound over here. And our bound is asymptotically optimal when the load gets high. So this is just a bound, okay, on, on this performance. And it's not such a horrible bound, actually. And we can even make it better than what we have here. So this analysis, um, we have repeated it in multiple, um, for multiple scheduling policies. There are a lot of scheduling policies that you can basically use this technique on, probably some we haven't thought of, okay? And you can come up with bounds on their performance. Okay, so what I did now is I went through this problem in the case where you know the job size. And I wanna just briefly say one or two words about what if you don't know the job size. So what if you're trying to do, so this is very new work, Sigmetrics 21, very new work. Um, what if you're trying to schedule this MGK, okay? You have no idea what the job sizes are. You do get to look at the job size distribution, okay? Because you've seen the jobs completing over time. You know the ages of the jobs. You know how much work has been done on the jobs. So you know their age, but you don't know which is big and which is small. So you can't do SRPT. Okay. So what scheduling policy should you use? If you've paid any attention to the beginning of my talk, okay, you might have an idea for what scheduling policy you should use. Would anybody like to type something into the chat? any idea for what you might use. You don't know anything about the job sizes except for their distribution, which you've watched over time. And um, and you're trying to figure out what to do. This, oh, Gittins K, thank you, thank you. Okay. Oh, and I also have an SERPTK. Okay, they're all excellent ideas. So Gittins K is a very natural idea. And, um, and so we have analyzed Gittins K Okay, um, and again, it's just a bound. 
that we're producing here. And again, it follows the same kind of approach of looking at a K-server system versus a one-server system and looking at something like relevant work. It's a little bit different, okay? But um, we basically show two results. The, we provide the first bound on Gittins K, and it's in terms of Gittins 1 and a whole bunch of other stuff. And then we show that this other stuff is little o of the mean response time for Gittins 1. And the result is that Gittins K is optimal in the limit as load goes to 1. So I'd like to summarize everything and conclude. So we've talked about a few recent breakthroughs from the last three years. The first dealt with MG1, um, which is the simplest model. And we looked at policies that had been analyzed. We extended it to the SOAP class, which is much broader. And we added in a whole bunch of policies. We then moved to the MGK, where we looked at scheduling and multi-server systems. And we found the first bounds and optimality results for a wide range of policies, um, still just a handful of policies. Okay, there's still a lot to be done, I think. Um, so this is it for the end of my talk. Um, I do have a slide on some open problems and things like that, if you wanna ask about that. Um, that's the this slide over here talking about open problems, um, but I will let people ask their own questions. Thank you. Okay, so please, uh, you can use chat in uh, in uh, Zoom, which is preferred way of asking questions by more. Or uh, so you can use chat. You can raise your hand if you can. Um, if you can yes, actually, I can. Um, I can try to unmute people. That yeah, if you can unmute yourself, that might be the easiest thing for me to be able to see. Okay, wait a minute. So hello, participants. So now all participants should be able to unmute themselves, okay? Yeah, so I'm just opening it up so I can see participants. First question is coming in chat. Yes, please. Um, yeah, so all of our assumptions are using a Poisson arrival process. So a Poisson arrival process, you can think of it as at every moment in time with some probability, some tiny, tiny probability. Like if time, if time was like really, really discretized, you can think of every moment in time, there's some probability that a job arrives. Um, the Poisson distribution has nothing to do with the job sizes. It's just the arrival process. And we do require a Poisson arrival process because memoryless property that it has. Yeah. I have a question. Yes. Uh, uh, the bounds that you have for the MGK, the, yeah. let's go back to that arrival process, as, at, uh, at, uh, especially the bounds that you have in heavy traffic. You expect that you can have some freedom on the arrival process, especially if the inter-arrival time distributions have an increasing failure rate. You think that your bounds still will hold for an arbitrary um, arrival process, increasing failure rate. However, the problem becomes if that arrival process have inter-arrival distributions that have a decreasing failure rate, or even let's say batch arrivals or something like that, then I think the bounds may get a little bit worse. Actually, with increasing failure rate, they may get a little bit better even, or at least they hold. In decreasing failure rate, they get a little bit worse, dependent upon the coefficient of variation or any batch arrival process. Have you looked at that, or do you have any conjectures in that? Yeah, direction? no. Uh, so our arrival process is just a Poisson process, and I've not changed the arrival process. We do look at different job size distributions, the G, OK? Um, we do look at different job size distributions and, and um, you know, different um, increasing failure rate, decreasing failure rate, different variability and stuff like that. Um, and there, sometimes the bound gets worse or better, you know, depending on the variability of the job size distribution. But um, the arrival process is always a Poisson process. Okay. Um, any other questions? Different distribution of speeds of servers other than uniform. Yeah. Um, yes. So if you look at the paper on SRPTK, so this was, um, I think, performance 2018. 
um, has the paper on the bounds for, for SRPTK, which is this result, um, you can see a few other distributions. And, um, and the bounds are, the, so the bounds that I showed you here, this was the bound that I showed you here, you'll see a few other pictures that look like that for other distributions. They're not all that different in terms of the effectiveness of the bound. Anybody else? So this is the G that I'm talking about, or, or here I call it X. The X talks about the job size. Any other questions? Anybody want to talk? I think the question was about heterogeneous servers, different speeds. Oh, heterogeneous servers. Thank you. I think I recognize your voice, Rhonda. Um, OK, so let's go back. Yeah. So everything that we've assumed here, let me go back here. Let me go back even one more. Everything that we've assumed here has assumed that the servers are homogeneous. Um, I think it's a very interesting question to ask what happens if the servers are heterogeneous where some are, some are faster and some are slower. Um, there's a lot of work on dealing with heterogeneous servers. Um, and what you want to do with your fast server versus your slow server, we have not we have not played in that arena. But I very much believe that that's a great area for future work. Anybody else have a question? Um, you can also ask about yeah. No. What is the biggest challenge when bringing theory into practice? approximating the arrival and size distributions or additional complications in the models themselves? Uh, okay, this is a question I can sink my teeth into. <laughs> okay, so I spend a lot of time on actually working with companies and bringing theory into practice. Um, so a small part of it is modeling the workloads. So I would say that modeling the job size distributions, you know, like, Thinking about the job size distributions, you know, are they are they highly variable or not too variable? And am I worried about short jobs or not worried about short jobs is one piece of it, okay? But the truth of the matter is that all these companies have a lot more complexities in their work. So um, that we in scheduling often don't take into account. I'm gonna move to my last slide here that I never showed. So I recently wrote a paper, this is 2001, on, on open problems in queuing theory. And some things in this paper are some of the models that I've seen companies um, have that, that in the queuing community, the scheduling community, we really haven't touched. So one example is something I call a multi-server job model. So the idea is this looks like an MGK, okay? And, and we're used to working with an MGK, we're used to K-server systems. But at companies today, the jobs themselves occupy multiple servers. So you can see the red job here occupies two servers. The blue job occupies one server. The yellow job can be paralyzed across five servers. So every job that I'm seeing at these data, in these data centers is actually a parallel job. So it's like some kind of machine learning job or something. And it comes in and it knows I need so many servers to run on. And now the question becomes, how do you schedule when you have you know, a limited number of servers and you have jobs coming in with these demands of certain number of servers that they wanna occupy? So this is an example of a problem that you know, the queuing and stochastic community has not really touched at all. And, um, and yet is fundamental to what's going on. We also have situations that I see at companies all the time where the jobs have different speed ups that they can obtain depending on the number of servers that you give them. So, so these are jobs that are kind of flexible in some way in the number of servers. And if you give them more servers, they'll run faster, but they'll run only somewhat faster. Okay, so they have depreciating benefit in terms of how much benefit they get from additional servers. And now you have a very big optimization problem of like how in the world are you gonna deal with scheduling these jobs that are paralyzable, but they have depreciating benefit and they might have different degrees of depreciating benefit. 
So my student Ben Berg works on these kinds of problems and has written a lot of problems like this. There are also a lot of problems that deal with tail scheduling. So trying to minimize the probability of exceeding a certain time. Companies are very interested in not exceeding that 500 milliseconds, okay? Um, scheduling people tend to write many beautiful papers on looking at this quantity as little t goes to infinity, like an asymptotic kind of thing. But that's really not what the companies want. <laughs> what the companies want is simply to not exceed that 500 milliseconds <laughs> very clearly. So you have a hard deadline. And policies dealing with deadlines are very difficult. Um, I can go on if people want to hear more or maybe there are other questions people have. So let's see. Um, so networks of cues. Ah, so yeah, so I'm kind of interested a little bit in this networks of cues. I can't say I have anything yet, um, but it would be very, very nice to take some of these scheduling policies and move them into networks of cues now. I know that's been done for a lot of classic scheduling policies. So it'd be great to take some of the SOAP policies. And move them. Are there other questions that I just have missed? Sorry, I'm trying to manage two computers at the same time. Anything else? Or anybody want to repeat a question? So if I may ask also more, uh, have you ever met uh, the case when some of the traffic is even triggered, like in your case where jobs are arriving and you handle them, let's say, online by the policy and some other schedules are time triggered. So we know that they will block beforehand. We will know that they will block your your system, uh, your server, because maybe the server is unavailable for your for your coming jobs or they are time triggered right. and so on. So you know that at certain times there are certain jobs that are going to be coming in. Uh, I know that no. at certain times the servers are blocked. They are at not certain blocked. times the servers will go away. They're blocked. Yeah. Yes. So, so they are running right. out of jobs that have been pre-scheduled. Pre let's say, okay. Right, right, right. High priority, and you know that at 15 uh, hundreds we will start our seminar, and I had to put all, all other duties, right? Yeah, yeah. So in the, in the queuing community, we often refer to that as the servers on vacation. So it's not really on vacation, but it's busy doing other things. Um, and a lot of the analysis we do does allow servers to go on vacation. Um, I, I can't say, you know, together with scheduling policies, what exactly we can do, but certainly first come first serve scheduling has definitely been analyzed where servers can go on vacation. Um, I, this is another one of the real world complexities that comes in all the time is that there might be some of these jobs like over here that have actually reserved certain servers for certain times. And then there might be times of the day where certain servers are not available. Um, yeah, another great question. Like I said, it's like most of the, most of the questions in scheduling have not been solved and, and are desperately in need of being solved, especially given our high variability. Um, yes, dark night via YouTube. Uh, my question is not directly related. Work regarding known job sizes for arbitrary arrivals on K servers. Um, so I'm not sure exactly what the question being asked is, but um, we talked about K server systems with known job sizes. I talked about SRPTK. There are a whole bunch of other policies that we can analyze for the K server system. Um, it's, it's not entirely arbitrary arrivals when we analyze them, it's a Poisson process. It's in that same paper that I referenced. Um, one of the other things that comes up in practice a lot, um, I don't think I put it in this paper, but maybe it's coming into a future paper, I guess, um, is the CMU rule. So it's, it's this idea where jobs have different value. Um, so I'm very interested in situations where um, not finishing a job is costing a company money. Um, so this is something that 
I, um, that the stochastic community works on a lot. So you have some jobs are small and some jobs are big, but not completing a job is actually costing you money. And then you have to think about how to prioritize the job. And this is one of those things that comes up in industry a lot, um, except that in industry, it looks pretty different from the theoretical problems that we work on. And I'm happy to answer questions about that too, if people find that kind of thing interesting. Are there any other questions? Do we consider the continuous scenarios where some time windows needs to be applied? I'm not sure what time windows are. I'm sorry. Um, I, I don't know what a time what time windows is referring to. Uh, yeah, because if we have some average, we need to take some window when we measure the average. Oh, I see. Okay. So yeah, so I'm looking at the average. Thank you. I'm looking at the average over across all jobs. So I'm looking at each job's response time and looking at the average across all jobs. So each job when it arrives until it finishes. Um, I suppose one could imagine looking only at averages within a time window that doesn't really make that much sense in the stochastic community. Um, usually averages are across jobs. Um, okay. Consider, yeah. So I'm hoping that we can kind of bring together, um, we can, thank you. I'm hoping we can bring together these communities by at least learning each other's language. Um, <laughs> And I'm, I'm very happy to answer questions offline. If people want to send me an email, I'm happy to, um, you can just type my name into Google and you'll get my email address. It's on my webpage. You can send me an email and I'm happy to try to answer questions offline. Okay, more. So thank you very much okay. for your talk and uh, responses to the questions. Uh, thank you. No more questions, we will close it. Thank okay. you. You want to make an announcement also for our next talk? Yeah, sure. Yeah. So maybe Guohua, if you are there, maybe you can announce. Should I, should I stop the screen sharing maybe if you want to share a screen or are you okay? Oh, I think it's more or less okay. Okay. So the, the next talk where Guohua is not going up. So the next talk will be given. So he's there. Guohua is there. Is there? Yes. So please yeah. go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, next talk will be uh, uh will be done by uh, Professor Li Xintang from Northwestern University in China, and uh, his uh, topic is uh, basically concerned with the applications of uh, scheduling theory in practice, especially in continuous uh, uh production system like uh, steel making. So uh, welcome all people uh, to join this uh, seminar series. Thank you. All right. So I think that's all. So thank you for, for joining us and hope to hear you and speak to you uh, in two weeks, right? Okay, more. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Eh? Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Wonderful bye -bye. talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye.